little, oh, it's working. Awesome. All right. Um, before I start, I just wanted to say thank you all for taking the time to come here. I know there's a whole bunch of cool stuff outside going on. They even have like a gaming room and all that. And um, to uh, the Culver Papers Review Board and to everybody involved in making BrewCon happen, just thank you so much for this opportunity, and I'm really excited. <laughs> so, um, this is a um, saddle of the system, a Texas handbook to a Linux EDR baseline configurations. So about me, just kind of like a quick intro. Offensive security engineer with 10 years of IT experience. The last six years of my career have been dedicated to IT security and pretty much the last couple of years have been more red teaming and pen testing. Uh, bachelor's degree in computer systems, and I started as a security operations and incident detection engineer for a children's hospital, and it was a really good and really good experience. And then there's the boring alphabet soup and yada yada. And uh, fun fact, this is my first time in Belgium and first brew gone, so it's exciting. <laughs> All right, so what are we doing here? We're going to talk about uh, a little bit about what kind of stuff do we want our EDR to respond to. When it comes to Linux endpoints, what kind of activity do we want to look out for? So this is by no means a comprehensive guide, but I'm going to pretty much highlight a little bit more of the tactics and the type of activity that could be relevant in the event that something potentially malicious happened. The bling ring. This is gonna be a little bit weird, but y'all are gonna have to trust me on this. So, in 2008, a group of celebrity-obsessed teenagers broke into the homes of several famous Hollywood residents, such as Paris Hilton, Orlando Bloom, Lindsay Lohan. They stole an estimated amount of $3 million in cash, couture, artwork, and other items. It wasn't until August 2009 that the authorities were able to get a better picture of these people whenever they broke into Lindsay's home and she was able to provide footage to um, pretty much the police department. So whenever they were brought in for questioning, they mentioned that it was thanks to social media and whatever was posted on Twitter and MySpace. Did anybody here ever had a MySpace? That was. Uh, yeah, I had one too, it was terrible. <laughs> but uh, thanks to that information that was being posted, it made it easier for them to target them because I'm gonna go on a fashion show, I'm gonna go on a tour, and you know, like whoever was out of town, that was who they targeted. And it was all openly available information, including their home addresses. And once they found their homes, they broke in, but they didn't really offer complicated things. It was just simple ways to break in. They didn't force any logs, or they didn't break any windows. They even said that whenever they broke into Paris Hilton's home, they found a key under the mat. So thanks to that, they were able to maintain persistence and keep coming back. When it comes to covering their tracks, they were really not the brightest, which was what eventually got them caught. So. If we think about this for a second, the way these people operated doesn't really differ that much of how an IT uh, attacker would operate. When it comes to research and reconnaissance, they use publicly available tools such as Shodan, Google Dorks, Census, or even LinkedIn, and that's how they target people. When it comes to sneaky entry, they look for external facing applications with um, basically an outdated version of whatever service they're running, outdated plugins, easy or guessable credentials, just anything that would be low hanging fruit. To maintain persistence, we're talking pretty much about scheduled tasks, creating a new user, command injection, or just masking a service and making it look legitimate. Covering their tracks, that would be tampering with logs, deleting history, tunneling, perhaps. So each one of these points represents a potential point of entry. We want to decrease the chances of this type of activity going undetected, and that's when our EDR comes into play. So what's really an EDR? I mean, we know what it is. We're really not going to reinvent the wheel. So this is a type of solution that provides ongoing monitoring or analysis of an endpoint activity. 
and it detects suspicious behavior. So just like common things that it does, threat detection, continuous monitoring, as long as there is communication with a sensor and a console, it's going to provide analysis at a sufficient frequency to provide adequate protection. For incident response, we all know how it works. It's just a threat is identified, it's contained, it's eradicated, and then we just kind of recover the system. But in the real world, let's just say, for example, Karen from Human Resources goes to download more RAM.com and she downloads more RAM. And it's a binary that she tries to run. And in ideally, so our EDR would respond in a way that it would contain the host and it would just pre or prevent the binary from being executed. Forensic analysis, just basically based on the data collected, we're able to investigate in the event that we need to do, do a little bit more further research. The beauty of this type of solutions is that we can also integrate them with other security solu solutions such as the SIM. So, common Linux attack vectors. These are potential ways that an attacker could get us. Privilege escalation, for example. So these are the type of vulnerabilities in Linux that can be exploited and give you higher privileges. And we're talking about kernel exploits, for example, or misconfigured pseudos, or set UID and set UID, just basically anything that would give us elevated privileges. Weak file permissions, that's something really good too that we want to look at. Lateral movement. So this happens, for example, when an SSH key gets compromised or a service account. And even if it's a service account that we're really not familiar with, nothing tells me that password cannot be reused later on you know, within the network. Malware and botnets. So those are Linux systems being infected with malware and often used to build botnets for distributed attacks. And then distributed denial of service. So these are Linux servers being compromised in a large scale of DDoS. Typical example, uh, flooding a host with ICMP requests. So you just kind of start pinging it like crazy. Or resource exhaustion. Web application attack is, a, is another common Linux attack vector. So this is basically what I was mentioning before, poorly configured applications, outdated plugins. This is an interesting vector because an EDR on its own is really not going to detect web application attacks. Why? Because we're talking about how a web application attack typically involves manipulating HTTP requests and responses. Additionally, for it to protect, would, it would have to be familiar with the web application logic or if it involves any additional component or if it's connected to a database. That's kind of out of the scope, but it's still a good practice. It's really recommended to have visibility to your web application server. Hold your horses. So we know what an EDR is. We know what it does. But we also want to know what do we need to do before we start testing for responses. Like, it's not like we can just jump and start testing and playing hacker and all that good stuff. There's a lot of red tape involved. So. Ensure we have management approval. If it's not documented, it didn't happen. And this is to cover ourselves in the event that something goes horribly wrong. So define goals and scope of the assessment. What are we actually trying to do? I mean, we're testing EDR responses, yes, but what I also like doing is thinking of this as an exercise to work with your security operations team, right? So how would they truly respond to something malicious happening? What would they do? And then gather required information. So obtain relevant details about your target, like host names, subnets, what is the role of the server within the network? Identify stakeholders. So it's not just the engineer that is pen testing or evaluating the responses from the sensor. There's a lot more to that. There is a system administrator that is taking care of the Linux endpoints. And then there's a person that is, well, the uh, security engineer that is deploying the EDR sensors. There's your security operations center team. So there's a lot more to that. And then you want to create an assessment plan. You want to define your steps, timeline, and methodologies that you're going to use. And establish communication channels. So remain in good communication with everybody that is involved within the assessment. Typical thing, 
and it's happened, you're testing a binary and your EDR response, your host gets contained, now you're not only disrupting your own work, but you're also disrupting somebody else's work, getting them to pull your host out of containment. So always, always tell people involved what you're trying to do. Gather required resources. So obtain everything you need for the assessment. Make sure that you have a good test account. Make sure that you have a testing host, like a testing VM. Just enough data to proceed with the assessment. If it's possible, try not to test in production. And if you do test in production, make sure that you're able to revert back to how it was before. Just don't break anything. <laughs> and review relevant policies and regulations. So this depends on the type of industry you're working on or you're working for. For example, banking and health. That's gonna be a completely different monster that if you were evaluating EDR responses for, I don't know, Lulu's nail salon down the road. So it really depends a lot. And then reporting, which is optional. If it's an internal assessment, a lot of the times it's really not mandatory. But you want to use this as an opportunity in the event that you had to retest in the future. So just be familiar with the steps that you took. For uh, this presentation, uh, I I'm going to be using Wazoo. So this is a solution that delivers security monitoring and uses its security information and event management capabilities. Basically, it's a SIEM and an extender EDR. Main components, Indexer, which is our search and analysis engine, or server, manages the agents and configures and updates. So it's just basically the sensor, the, the endpoints where we're deploying the sensors, and our dashboard, which is the web interface where we see all our cool stuff. Fun fact, when I was working on this presentation, I basically installed everything in one single server, which is totally fine, but in the real world, that's a recipe for disaster. So you want to have some separation when it comes to your indexer, your server, and your dashboard. Yeah, and then like a couple of days later, I found out that there was a VM that had everything bundled up together. So yeah, I spent a good time troubleshooting like crazy. Okay, some of the WASU capabilities, file integrity moni monitoring, this is going to overlap a little bit with what I mentioned before. It also uh, has malware detection as a capability, active response, it logs data, command monitoring, doesn't necessarily have to be a malicious command, but we're gonna talk about, it about, uh, about um, what truly makes a malicious command malicious. And it also provides agentless monitoring, which is perfect for uh, legacy systems or for environments that are a little bit more restricted. So now, here comes the good stuff, baseline configurations. So I'm going to be talking about some of the tactics and provide a couple of examples. Like I said, this is not a comprehensive guide, but we're looking at the bigger picture. We're all familiar with Nmap. We know what it is and what it does, which is perfect when it comes to service discovery and host discovery within a network. So again, this is both a tool and a weapon. On this command on its own, it's not malicious, but attackers typically use, use it for enumeration and to gather more information whenever they compromise the system, or even before. Enumeration scripts. So the purpose of them is to automate the enumeration process Instead of running all the typical checks manually, you know, like whenever you have access into a Linux host, a couple of things you want to do first. You want to know who you are as a user and what can you do as that user. So what they do is just gather system information, potential vulnerability detection, automation and customization, just basically runs all the checks you would want to see. Privilege escalation. That's another tactic. So common techniques, well, first privilege escalation is a set of techniques that attackers commonly ta take to execute to gain higher level permissions, right? So I'm just like a regular average Joe user. I want all the goodies, I wanna be root. So scheduled tasks, valid accounts. So if I find a service account, doesn't necessarily mean that it's gonna give me higher privileges, but it might give me access to a system that could provide me more information that could lead me to root. 
or abusing elevation control mechanisms, said UID and said GID. So whenever the said UID and said GID bit is on, what an attacker does is just basically try to find a flaw in the binary and explode it. And the good, well, the interesting part is whenever you run these binaries, you're able to run them as a, basically a high-level user. But think of non-utilities. For example, what would happen if Vim has said, said UID bit on? Basically, you could just execute commands within the actual text editor or a misconfigured pseudo. So you're just going to be able to run commands like arbitrarily and just have elevated access. And then SSH authorized keys, creating or modifying system processes, making them look legitimate. Let's just say, for example, um, something random like Lenovo Auto Updater. So you come up with that and make it look like it's something legitimate when it's totally not. Just mask a service and make it look like it's something real. And then hijacking execution flow, that's manipulating an application and making it look like um, just getting it to do something that it's really not meant to do. Okay, this is a typical example. I'm looking for a random binary that it's running as said UID. Run it, gave me root access, just very standard. And this is what I was mentioning before. In some cases, based on the type of binary, in this case, it's a test editor, editor and I could run commands. And if it, if it has the said UID bit on, I could just basically run commands with an elevated access. Now, weaponizing existing utilities. None of these utilities on their own are bad. I mean, mount, this is pretty generic. Like the most basic standard user is gonna be able to use it and nothing bad comes out of it. However, attackers sometimes weaponize them in several ways. So they could mount a remote share from an attacker server and create a backdoor. So they have access and they're just gonna start exfiltrating files. Binding an existing directory to another and redirecting access to a control directory or executing a root shell for privilege escalation. Or my per personal favorite, nested mounting. So that would be a file system within another file system. And they, they use this method to conceal malicious files. A lot of the times your EDR is really not gonna uh, pick up nested mounting. So in this example, these are two very basic and generic harmless binaries. And the beauty of them is like, even though they're harmless, I'm still going to be able to detect this activity. Like I can still get my EDR to alert me whenever privilege escalation was attempted with any of these binaries. So in this, in this case, I'm just doing pseudo mount, I'm binding a shell, and then I'm gonna make reference to the mount location. So, and it's there, and just, it's gonna give me root. There it is. Okay. Ooh. So what I'm doing in here is within Wasu, so I'm, I'm gonna start looking. Okay. <laughs> it was supposed to play it. All right, it was supposed to play the video and it didn't. Oh, there it is. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, okay. Uh, so the video was do is that it, let, it gives me the ability to create pre-customized searches and look for whatever I need to look for. So yes, it has predefined detectors, but I could also get it to alert me on anything in particular that I wanna see. And in this case, if I wanted to see how this binary or any random binary uh, gets used for privilege escalation, I could get that too. So if I see uh, the, if I look at the matter rule, I could see that it's making reference to privilege escalation. And in here, I can create a saved query and refer to it in the future if I wanted to. If I could type, I couldn't. <laughs> and then just kind of save the, ch the search and I can come back to it later on. So it's there. And we got one hit. So, awesome. So whenever I was working on this, it made me think of something. 
How do we detect malicious utilities being misused? How do we see the running on the wall, really? If we, wanna, if we wanted to do that, we could start tracking, monitoring, execution. Again, this is gonna give us a lot of room for potential error, but this is why it's important to have uh, visibility and not just randomly be ingesting logs like crazy. So you wanna create potentially, um, you know, like useful customized detectors. So you wanna, this is why you want good logging. You wanna track instances based on the context of how a binary is used. You also want to detect sensitive usage. Which files are being targeted? For example, let's just say somebody is trying to copy the shadow file into a very new directory from a random user that is low privilege. There should really be no reason to do this. You also want behavioral analysis and context. So you want to look at your network traffic, user activity, system events. Look for something that would be unusual. And again, what makes unusual unusual? And let's just say, for example, the wget command on its own is not malicious. But if you start seeing a lot of wget requests within a very short period of time, within random, um, with random IP addresses from random different locations on a Saturday at 3 in the morning, that's, that's already a lot of red flags. And then monitoring file integrity. So detect changes on sensitive files, for example, SSHD config, shadow file, so anything that could potentially either disclose information or break something. And then you also want to look at file integrity violations. SSHD config, that's a prophetic example. So this is a primary configuration file for SSH, and the file contains directives that tell the SSH server how it needs to behave. So what kind of changes do we want to look at? For example, changing the SSH port, typical it's 22, but some people change it to other numbers just for obfuscation reasons. It's not necessarily something good or bad, it's just something different. Allowing root login, allowing anti-passwords, that's a big no-no regardless. Modifying user access list, or changing authentication methods, for example, disabling 2FA, or disabling logging. This doesn't just go for SSH, but for any service. If you see your logging is disabled, then something really twisted could be going on. This is an example of how I'm modifying SSHD config, just random, random couple changes. And then modifying Etsy shadow, that is another sensitive file you wanna track changes for. So this file contains a hash version of the existing accounts and unauthorized changes could potentially indicate an attempt to obtain changes to the system by tampering with existing user accounts. So, I mean, if you think about it, if you really, why would be an actual reason to change the shadow password directly? Whenever you're changing, it typically means you're changing a password, but you could do that through the command line. So I'm not really saying, hey, this is malicious, but you wanna investigate further. And in here, this is a, an example of how I'm replicating these changes, and we're gonna see if we visualize them in Wazoo. So I'm gonna change the configuration file, and I'm gonna change it to port 2222, and another additional change, from no to yes, and then save it. And then again, but this time with Etsy shadow, and I'm going to change my password. So in there, okay, these are very harmless changes. Using grep to make sure that it actually took, took it, and it did, awesome. All right, what would this look like in Wazoo? And in here, I'm gonna go to my events, and I'm able to see that there is a file integrity module and I'm able to track that yes, there is an SSHD config change in here and another one for Etsy shadow. And I can see that it makes reference to my host, Dallas VM, and I have a couple pretty fine change, um, searches based on the activity that I'm trying to track. So, again, if something is not being detected, we can get it to detect, to be detected, so. And next, 
credential access. So credential dumping, that's another tactic that we want to keep in consideration. So this is a technique that allows an attacker to obtain sensitive information related to authentication, such as usernames, passwords, tokens. Some common methods, memory dumping. Another one is password files, just what I was mentioning about Etsy Shadow. Configuration files. Uh, see, this, this one is particularly interesting, interesting because I was mentioning before how a lot of attackers target ex externally facing servers. I was working on an assessment a couple months ago and I noticed an application, actually this was longer than a couple months ago, but um, an application that was externally facing and it was also vulnerable to local file inclusion. So based on that local file inclusion vulnerability, I had access to a configuration file that was pretty much keeping a password there. I wasn't able to use it for that particular host, but it did work for others, so that was a big red flag. You also want to look at your system logs and network sniffing. That's another method that you can use for credential dumping. So credential dumping using a bash one-liner. This detector in particular caught my attention because there should be no reason whatsoever why you should be reading the shadow file from a reverse shell. If you need to access a shadow file, do it from SSH like a normal person. This, looking at this just right away, this reads credential exfiltration. So um, I did know about an instance where, where a famous ADR vendor didn't really pick up this detector and this was brought up to their attention and they were able to work on it and just update their product based on this detection. This was a combined effort. So this wasn't all me, just multiple people working on it. Persistent mechanisms. That's another tactic you wanna, you wanna detect too. So adding a new cron job. So this is a configuration file that specifies the schedule and commands for cron jobs. Most common thing that we see like in Hack the Box or just any of those platforms, you use it for a reverse shell, right? An attacker might not just settle for a reverse shell. Sometimes they just want different things. Sometimes they just want to uh, disrupt services. Sometimes they just want to wipe their logs. So think of how other ways this could be weaponized. If you run a scheduled task or a cron job, let's just say to run every 12 hours and completely wipe the logs of a, of a directory, or just like start generating a lot of random files. And in here, I can see that this detector was being picked up by, by Wazoo. Creating a new system D service. So this is another detector. Adversaries can establish persistence by creating or altering system D services to continuously run malicious payloads. And how do they do this? They could, they could abuse this by, you know, like multiple different ways. For example, they could create a new malicious service. They could modify an existing service and making it look like, you know, like just a normal change. Disguise a legitimate service and make it look like it's something real when it's not. Again, Lenovo Auto Updater, that could be an example. You make it look like it's legit and it's something that it's doing a completely different task. Uh, configuring services to run at a specific intervals. In this example, what I was doing is creating a very generic script that what it does is just like gives you a timestamp and it puts it in a file called timestamp.log. So it's there. And I'm starting the service and I'm looking at the, at the output. Again, this, this um, new service doesn't really do anything malicious, doesn't do anything bad. But let's just think of the bigger picture in here. At a, at attacker, an attacker might not always um, settle for reverse shells, right? They might look for other ways to disrupt a system or to cause denial of service. What would happen if this file or this service row too frequently to this log file, right? Or, or if it started generating too much output, 
This, was, this would really bring a whole bunch of other additional problems, such as excessive disk usage or service disruption. So. OK, in here, I'm disguising a legitimate service and making it look like it's going to be doing something bad. It doesn't. Creating a service called a novel auto updater, and it's going to make reference to a script called change background. So let's just say that every certain amount of time, it's just going to change uh, a desktop background, right? So again, it's really not supposed to be doing that, but we're getting to make it look like it does. Another detector that we want to be looking at is modifying bash RC and bash profile. So these are shell scripts that execute shell commands to configure a user's environment. Bash profile runs when a user logs into a shell, just kind of when you're trying to SSH into a system for the first time. And then bash RC executes for non-logging shells. Let's just say you're already in the GUI, you're clicking on the little um, command icon, and you're just working from it. How could this be abused? They use it to create persistence. They insert malicious commands. They capture sensitive information, passwords, tokens, API keys. Or they could just hide activities. They could just completely like wipe it. Here's an example of how this could be abused. OK, so I'm just going to make a couple changes, nothing crazy. I'm going to generate like an echo string. So echo, Texas is better than Oklahoma. Fun fact, Oklahoma is our neighboring state, and we kind of have this love-hate relationship with them, especially when it comes to like college football, because we're much cooler than them, and yeah. <laughs> so now I'm going to source this file, and just going to see if this change has got applied. So sourcing the file, and awesome. What happens if I open a command line? Whoopsie. And again. And again, again, this is harmless, but an attacker could get really creative. Defense evasion. So this is another really sensitive activity that we really want to make sure that gets picked up. So they tamper, a hacker could tamper with our EDR systems to avoid detection. And this could include stopping the EDR sensor, completely uninstalling it, or getting it to stop updates. So subbing an update pretty much prevent the latest security patches from being applied. And in here, I'm just identifying the process that is making reference to my EDR and then completely just like killing it. System call analysis. This is one of my favorite detectors. So S-Trace. So as we know, S-Trace is a Linux utility that it's used for system diagnosis and debugging, and it's also used for intercepting and recording system calls. So system call analysis involves observing and analyzing the system calls being made by, by processes to detect potential malicious activities. So let's just say, for example, we try to attach S trace to an existing process. And this type of detections could be flagged in multiple ways. For example, patterns of system calls that are unusual for a typical process behavior. Realistically, is there any reason why this tool should be written in this process? Or specific system calls being traced. For example, reading calls. Like, what are you trying to read into? Let's just say you attach S trace into a system that is making reference to Kubernetes or to a MySQL database. Yeah, that would get you a little bit more intel into potential um, infrastructure information. So, And then using system calls, uh, tracing tools, L-Trace or S-Trace. The example that I'm going to show you guys, I'm going to attach S-Trace into the oldest running SSHD process and uh, pretty much like attach a read call. So here's what I'm doing in here. I always run the date command for no reason. So I'm going to use S trace. I'm forking the process so it doesn't only read the child processes, but also the parent process. And then grabbing to just pick up SSHD. 
running it in verbose mode and getting it to read. Okay, perfect. So my one-liner is running. Now I'm going to create SSH traffic by trying to SSH into another server. And I'm doing that now. And I'm going to see what happens in the background since I'm trying to read into this process. Okay. So my session is about to start. It's there. Now I'm going to escalate privileges and see what is going on in the background. Okay, so this is a lot of gibberish, but oh my, I see a password in clear text, and I also see a user account. And that's just from getting S-trace to read into an SSHD process. Additional detections. I'm trying really, really hard not to get triggered by this particular slide. Um, so automated exploitation, automated exploitation tools. So these tools are designed to automate the process of identifying and exploiting vulnerabilities within systems. So this tool can scan for weaknesses, deploy exploits, and even escalate privileges. And the reason why I'm saying that I'm trying not to get triggered is there is this group of people within the industry that have been propagating this idea that hackers do not use automated exploitation tools and it's something that needs to stop. A hacker is gonna use whatever they want to get you any way they can, right? So there isn't such thing like, I don't need to get my EDR to pick it up. Like you do need to. Uh, common examples, Metasploit, um, SQL map, cobble strike, burp. And how do we detect these tools being used? Uh, Signature-based detections, behavioral analyses, file integrity, just endpoint monitoring. This is why I say you, you have to make sure that you have good communication with your endpoints. Analyzing your logs too, just make sure you're logging correct information. So another, um, another detector we want to be looking at is hijacking execution flow with LD preload, which is an environmental variable. So as we know, these are the type of files, they are dynamic name values that make reference to specific file location. So this is a trick that Linux uses to get a specific version of a file from a different location that it would typically be pulled. So, the purpose of this is to override some functions to the process with customized versions or to inject extra code into the process runtime. So when, when does this even work? So this is perfect when it comes to debugging or sandboxing, you know, like when you're testing something, this is great, but attackers always find a way to twist things, right? So if we compile this little code snippet, the printf function is gonna be loaded from the uh, libso library, which is a typical standard C library. But if we set the LD preload variable to point to a shared object file that we have control over and we get to decide what's being pulled and what's being written, uh, the dynamic linker will load our file instead of the default C library. So this is where attackers just kinda get creative. Now, identifying emerging malware trends. What does this even mean and why are we even talking about this? A lot of the times when new malware comes in, we don't really have updated IOCs about, about it, right? We don't really have a lot of reference, we don't really have a lot of IP sometimes, or signatures, or hashes, or context. But it doesn't really matter because, well, it does matter, but we're smarter than that. We don't really have that information, we try to look for it. Case study on SSH Snake. When I was working on this presentation, uh, SSH Snake was fairly newish, and this was back around July or June. Uh, this tool is designed to automatically perform network traversing using SSH private keys. So this purpose is to create a detailed map of the network and its dependency, evaluating to what extent a network can be compromised. For example, I find on SSH key how many hosts or how many hits can I get within a network if I try to use it. So pretty much you're going buck wild with the SSH key. All right, that's good and all that stuff, but what does it actually do? So once we locate an SSH key, on our current system, 
we identify hosts where we can reuse it or where it's accepted. And then we start attempting SSH connections to all the destinations that were identified. If we do establish a successful connection, this is just gonna go iterating like a rinse, rinse and repeat, just repeating all these steps. This is an example. The output is gonna be a little bit messy. So I'm gonna be looking at my host name and who I am as a user. Now I'm gonna run this script. Okay, I see a private key and I see a session that is starting. This is the type of information that is picking up and I am getting a lot of output, but I also see that it generated three new shell accounts, which is telling me that the SSH keys that were found can be using, can be, can be using three different hosts. And I'm looking at them right now and it's really showing me, it's also showing, showing you my SSH keys. Again, this is generating a crazy amount of output, but I would wanna clean this up a little bit and see which IP addresses is it hitting. So in here, I'm just gonna parse a regex and get it to extract the IP addresses where I could start an SSH session. I'm parsing this regex, and I'm running the script and just extracting the IPs. Trying to validate the results, it's taking some time, and I can see three different IP addresses where an SSH session was established based on compromised keys. Oh. All right, so we run the script. How do we really identify malicious activity? If we don't have our IOCs and we don't really have a lot of information, what can tell me that bad activity is bad? Process anomalies, for example, user accounts, elevated privileges, process names. If it's a process that we're not familiar with, that's something that we want to be alerted on. Unusual network activity. This is a massive red flag. In this case, high volume of SSH traffic, which is what happened with SSH snake. Ports, port 22, that's already a sensitive port. Suspicious IPs. In this case, I was trying to hit a whole bunch of IPs within a very short period of time. So that's something else we want to watch out for. File system changes, file location, user directories. In that particular case for SSH snake, I was looking at a sensitive, sensitive directory, which is the one that is keeping those SSH keys. Unusual DNS queries. If it's a domain we're really not familiar with, that's another one. Or suspicious use of common tools, which is what I was mentioning before when it comes to binaries. A binary on its own might not be bad, but it's the context of how you're using it. Let's just say, for example, when CAD was being used to read the shadow file from a, from a reverse shell. So that's just, it's not a bad binary, it's not malicious, it's how you're using it. All right, so we made it to the end. Final thoughts, this is just like, too long didn't read. <laughs> uh, five Ps, that means prior preparation prevents poor performance. Before testing, make sure, make sure that you have everything you need. So make sure that you have approval. You know, if it's not documented, it didn't happen. Make sure that you have everything you need. You have a user account to test. You have a VM to test. And if there's, in the event that you actually broke something, make sure that you're able to revert it back. Um, think as an attacker. Consider tactics to identify weaknesses. So what kind of, Malicious activity, would a person do to get what they want? In the EDR context, just don't go outside doing crazy stuff. And uh, trust but verify. So ensure that your EDR works as intended. So make sure that you are getting what you're paying for. So don't go for whatever they tell you that your EDR does. Make sure it actually does it. Uh, rinse and repeat, conduct periodic assessments. So a lot of people treat IT security solutions, and this is not just for EDR, this is just for pretty much anything in IT, as a one-time 
one-time type of deployment and they completely forget about it later down the road. So just because a security control is implemented, number one, doesn't mean that it's working fine. Number two, doesn't mean that it was implemented correctly. So always make sure that you're retesting. And then document your work. Make it easier on yourself in the event that you have to retest. And at the end of the day, this is your baby. Like, take pride on your work. And that's it. Okay, let's go for a QR session. Do you have some questions there? Hello, thank you for the presentation. Um, a lot of workloads these days are becoming containerized, like we get a container image from a vendor and we just run it on our Linux servers. Do you find that these EDR tools work well with containerized uh, workloads and do we need to modify our container images before we run them or are the hosts, uh, the agents running on the hosts enough to protect the, the containers as well? Um, I'm, I'm really sorry, I think it's just my, my thing. Uh, you were mentioning if, if EDRs are enough to protect a host, if, if that... If you're running containerized, for example, uh, Docker containers, you get some Docker containers from a vendor, you're running them on your system, Is, uh, are the EDRs capable of monitoring these as well? So, um, I, thank you so much for that question. That's a very interesting approach. Uh, when it comes to... Um, EDRs on its own, I like thinking that we shouldn't really rely on just one solution to protect, um, you know, like whatever system or anything that you're looking at. So yes, your EDR is necessary, but you also want to be um, using additional tools and taking a defense in depth approach. So your EDR is good, but you also want to see, want to make sure that you're getting visibility from your sim that you're capturing logs, that you're creating correlation searches. So let's just say your EDR doesn't respond and or the sensor isn't really working. You can still fall back, for example, on correlation searches or activity from your firewall. So an EDR on its own, it might not really be, might not really be enough. So you also want to work with other security solutions and integrate them as well. All right, thank you. Thank you.